Works Committee in Wisconsin Rapids. We're meeting this evening, Tuesday, March 5th, 2019. We're in the first floor conference room at City Hall. It's 6 p.m. We're on time again this month. So, uh, With that, I'll call the meeting to order. Item 2, review the DPW report. So you've got the report in your packet. Yep. We'll get the full report online here soon. Uh, a couple highlights, I guess, I'd like to uh, focus on. Buildings and grounds. The generators at Fire Station 1 and 2 are now online. Uh, the old ones still need removing, but uh, that's good news. The City Hall's new generator is sitting on the pad out back, and it's awaiting some gas piping in the installation of the transfer switch. Um, there were quite a bit of, uh, there was quite a bit of damage resulting from the storm two weeks ago. Uh, we've suffered quite a bit of damage at Robinson Park and some power lines were damaged. They were, uh, I, I can't tell you today what the condition is, but uh, a week ago they were still damaged and uh, you know, lower priority because the park's not being actively used, but uh, we're awaiting repair there and uh, this spring there'll be extensive tree cleanup work in, in some of those parks, especially Robinson Park. Um, in engineering, we're in the process of uh, continuing to work on a plan for uh, resurfacing and part of that is uh, right away management rules and degradation fees. We're researching what some other communities do, what some other uh, larger cities do, both in the United States and in you know, neighboring Canada, just to see what, uh, what type of recommendation to make. Um, so we're working on that as we speak. Our utility pre-construction meeting for our 2019 construction projects is set for March 7th, where city staff will meet with the utilities to discuss the projects and project scopes, project schedules. Uh, the tentative 2019 construction schedule for our projects is shown on the engineer's page on the city website. Uh, with the stormwater utility and One Mile Creek, there's an easement agreement that was mailed to property owners, a, a draft on October 30th of 2018. Uh, there were a numerous discussions with property owners over the last several months. A neighborhood meeting was held on February 27th to discuss concerns with property owners. Next step include finding examples of permitted dams, a list of requirements, habitat enhancement options, and communication with the Army Corps of Engineers and DNR. And uh, just to refresh your memory, that project um, on the One Mile Creek by airport, there's a structure, or two mile, I guess. Two mile. Yeah, two two mile, mile, there's a structure. Um, that structure is not currently permitted, um, and it's currently privately owned. So there's, yes, so there's some um, potential benefit to the city and to the property owners if the city ends up uh, taking control of that and maintaining it, and uh, it'll, it'll be effective towards our credits and reducing uh, phosphorus and sediment. So um, those discussions continue to see if those property owners are um, are interested in that. And so far the discussions have been very positive. Um, as you all likely know for streets, most of the month was spent plowing, hauling, and moving snow. Um, you know, we had 10 nights of midnight to noon and each of those evenings averaged five to 7,000 yards of snow. And uh, if you haven't seen our, our end loader, snow blower unit that loads the trucks, we can fill a quad axle truck in 35 seconds. Uh, we spread about 600 tons of salt and about 230 yards of uh, salt sand um, over the last several weeks. Wanted to, last month I talked a little bit about some of the work that our mechanics are doing, obviously keeping all of our equipment uh, in shape for plowing is really important because we do work as a team out there and, uh, and if any part of the team isn't working it, it does delay the whole project and the guys have been doing a great job but in your packet there's a couple pictures in there. Um, you may recollect a few months ago the city replaced an old tractor an old John Deere tractor that had a three-point hitch with a broom on the back that we used to broom the pond with a used uh, mini end loader and our staff took that old hydraulic broom fabricated a 
plate so that it works with the quick attach equipment on that mini end loader and uh, and freshened up that broom it doesn't look like a 35 38 year old broom anymore it looks like it's brand new works great we also took uh, an old snow plow <coughs> from a, one of our one-ton trucks did the same thing um, cut it off of the uh, frame that it was on mounted it to a quick attach frame and now that mini loader works as a snow plow a broom uh, an end loader with a bucket and also uh, we've got a clam attachment for uh, picking up brush and things like that. So um, that has been a great investment and really pleased since it's slightly used, we saved a lot of money on the purchase price of that. So uh, once again, kudos to the maintenance staff for their creativity and fabrication. Uh, with wastewater, the bitter cold temperatures has uh, made it tough for the collection system uh, to operate smoothly um, you know staff's been challenged keeping the lift stations clear so that they can access and maintain those there is uh, since we have our permit for our exceptional quality class A biosolids that is available for local residents and companies to utilize as uh, state certified commercial fertilizer so um, we, you know, anyone that's interested can contact Ryan at the wastewater plant, and uh, our our goal is to try to find a few local landscapers or or someone who's interested in essentially all of it. We'd rather not have people in and out, but we're open to all sorts of ideas at this point, and it is available. Um. Under other, there's a number of, uh, of meetings and, and uh, interviews and things like that that I attended this last month that I did want to mention um, that I did attend with some of you, the Chamber of Commerce Annual Awards Banquet and Mayor Verwink was awarded Citizen of the Year for Commitment to the Community Service, Entrepreneurship and Business Development. And Jeremy Sickler and the Airport Commission was awarded the Regional Economic Impact Award for the nearly $12 million in successful grant applications and expansion projects at the airport. Um, you know, it's, it's seldom that any government agency would be recognized, um, you know, by the Chamber of Commerce um, for those types of activities. So that's, uh, that's really, I think, a proud moment for the city. Um, also like to mention that Chief Blevins and I made two presentations to the um, to four different sixth grade classes at the middle school relating to academic career planning and cooperative emergency response uh, planning and activities. Uh, the rest of the report will be online so uh, it's winter time but there's been a lot of work being done in public works this last month. Real, Thank you, Joe. Questions? Real, yeah, real quick, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, Joe, uh, in terms of you made the comment that the front end loader has got a snowblower attachment that can fill a, a tandem axle or a quad, or quadra axle 35 seconds. in 35 seconds. Do we have enough equipment and or manpower to completely have the dump truck drivers in-house or are we contracting to, to haul that away. So we're working in-house. Um, we have enough drivers to make the rounds right now where, you know, where that end loader with that blower is not waiting for the next truck. Um, because not only are we running quads, but we've got a couple tandems and a couple single axle trucks that we're putting in the rotation as well. So, you know, once we get, and that is, is the case now, um, downtown, we're pulling snow out of the downtown, we're pulling snow off the boulevards in a lot of the areas, uh, uh, Baker Street, uh, 8th Street, we just finally got finished here the other day, um, around the schools, and you know we're working right now primarily on intersections, trying to get uh, corners cleared. We will probably work one more evening shift. Our, our staff's getting, as you can imagine, kind of tired of swinging hours and working nights and then working days and, and whatever. But uh, 
you know, so we're trying to, you know, it, it, I think it's in everybody's best interest for us to pull snow during the evening when traffic's light. Um, it's just safer that way. Um, but at the same time, you know, we have a lot of other work that needs to be done with potholes now to fill and, and that. But uh, we do continue to pull snow. Um, currently, we're trying to open up vision triangles on our uh, busier streets. And a Thursday night or Friday morning, we're, we're going to be pulling some from the East River or the West Riverview Expressway um, to Second Avenue and then down Second Avenue. So we, we still are pulling snow off the boulevards, making room in case we have another major event and you know doing our best to scratch and get intersections as clear as we can. Uh, for those viewing though, you know, we recognize we've got a number of complaints. We recognize that a lot of the local streets are pretty classy, they're rough, they're somewhat rutted. Um, you know, we're working on them the, the best we can, but pe people do have to really pay attention and try to slow down because they can be really slippery and, and those little rutted areas can can surprise you and all of a sudden face your vehicle in a different direction. So uh, it's definitely been challenging, I think, for everybody. and. We certainly appreciate the public's patience as we do what we can to clear the streets. Wonderful, thank you. Did, and just to follow up on it a little bit more. Did we not not get on it soon enough that caused all that rutting? Because I've been working down the town of Rome, and, and I and it, was, it was amazing between Rapids and Wood County roads were very similar, and then you got to Adams County, and they were crystal clear. And I, and I, and I was trying to figure out, did we? Did we, with that rain and slush, did we miss something there that caused the pileup to what we have now? That so we did get quite a bit more snow. Okay, I, um, I, I didn't know. What. And and we we did spend quite a bit of time um, that Saturday evening before it snowed on Sunday while, when it was raining. Hmm. We had staff in. Um, you know the we were having some issues with catch basins getting plugged up. Oh, yeah. So we spent a lot of that evening Saturday scratching away trying to get water cleared off the streets and our according to our policy our primary objective while it's snowing is keeping those main open. highways and, and arterials open um, but the volume the sheer volume of traffic a lot of them it got packed down and especially in the local streets once it got packed down it's out. it's a pretty futile attempt when it got cold. So because we have so many miles of road, it takes you know 12 hours to to get through and plow. And so you know the struggle is you can start before the storm's done, but then you're plowing it twice. That's pretty much what we did this time. But um, yeah, it, it results just from the cars and the amount of traffic resulted in a lot of um, packing. Uh, we we struggled. I mean, we, we were plowing nonstop on Eighth Street and the Expressway, and uh, you know there was an inch and a half of hard pack. It was so windy and drifting snow. You know, we tried some test areas where we salted the heck out of it, um, but it was drifting across fast enough where the salt wasn't getting down to the bottom where we could peel it off. So we did try a lot of things and, and tried to stay on top of it, but. We're just kind of a victim of the of the circumstances. If that rain would have stayed a little further north, I don't think we'd have had quite the situation that we that we had. And the the other issue that kept some of our staff off the streets is with the trees down and the power lines down and all that. We had to send the entire parks group trimming, removing, you know, and that that slowed down the plowing operations as well. No, I, they worked hard. They took yeah. hours. In, that's yeah. For sure. But hopefully it's coming to an end. I think so. We're into March. I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. All right, uh, item three, review uh, proposals for concrete uh, curb and gut and sidewalk. So I handed out the, uh, the bids that we received this afternoon for the 2019 concrete contract. We got two proposals back, two bids back. Ember Company submitted and Chippewa Concrete Services submitted. Um, both of them have done work in the city in the past and um, Chippewa will actually be 
performing work on the East Grand Avenue project underneath as a subcontractor for the main DOT project. Um, but Pember Company is with a low bid uh, for this contract in the amount of $550,064.03. Uh, Chippewa Concrete had a bid of $644,000. $2.50 and um, took a look at all their documents. They've got everything submitted. Um, so staff would recommend awarding um, uh, to the apparent low bidder of Pember companies in the amount of $550,064.03. I'll move to award the bid to Pember. I'll second that. Any discussion? I do, and um, uh, Joe, um, as far as with only having a couple bids on here, what are some of the different, or Joe too, either one, it doesn't matter. Um, what, what are some, I guess, how would I phrase this, what are some uh, um, barriers for contractors not to want, either not to want to bid or that can't bid on this? Like, are there smaller contractors that potentially could, or is it because we're not ready for them or the, the, the project isn't ready for them, so they gotta come in and come out, so they need a larger crew or a diversified crew, or what would be the reason why we're only getting two bids? Are we bidding this out too late? Is this something that we should be doing in January? Uh, what are some things that you could recommend to the committee as well as the council that we could do to give you guys the tools to so that we can see more contractors on here? So we so this is the right time of the year to be bidding these projects. Um, I think typically are we last year were we in probably in April. April? Yeah. Um, and so that's something that the engineering department's been tasked with is trying to get these out early and, and they met that goal. Um, I think there were a couple of other potential bidders that had yeah, so pulled plans and SDL and Becker, they were plan holders. So this list is all the plan holders. Um, Summers Construction, both of them have worked for the city in the past. Uh, we did contact them before the bid opening just to see you guys, should we expect them to come yet or what are you guys thinking? And um, I think SDL and Becker, they had a bunch of uh, awards that from the week prior that they were kind of satisfied with the amount of work that they were getting, so they weren't they weren't interested um, to submit at that at this time. And then Summers contacted them, and we didn't really we didn't get a reason, just that they wouldn't be submitting. So the, the other two, um, they probably pulled plans just to see what was what the contract had included. But other than that, um, we did pull out all of our maintenance work. So all of our sidewalk and curb and gutter maintenance work, we pulled that out as a separate local um, proposal. And um, those are currently being looked at by local companies, um, small companies. And um, so we thought maybe that would help too, uh, where these bigger contractors, you know, they get in and do the, crank out the curb and gutter and lay down a lot of concrete in a short period of time versus the, sort of daily grind of the, the maintenance work, but. I guess this is more of an arbitrary kind of question for you, <coughs> each of you, I guess. Is there a market for other contractors to get involved with this? Obviously, we, if we get 10 to choose from that, we potentially might drive the our cost down, but is it just our location? I, I mean, a lot of work. There's so a lot. There's a lot of work out there. So there could be room for other contractors actually, with plenty of work out there. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think what I've seen over the years is the number of contractors, especially smaller contractors that are looking at projects like this, has diminished significantly since 2009. Um, you know, the big contractors are still looking at DOT projects major reconstruction projects but uh, this is not unusual a lot of municipalities see no bid projects and that's a real problem that's something that it, uh, at the public works conference the last two years there's there's been a, a full presentation on the fact that that's a problem for a lot of municipalities the projects that we're trying to do 
there aren't enough contractors. There's building projects going on for schools. There's other municipal contract projects. Um, they're, they can afford to be very picky. Um, and, and because of the, the finance market being as strict as, as it is now, it's challenging uh, for any newcomer to get in the game. It's you know, just almost impossible. So um, that, that way we're fortunate that we have some capacity in house for our street construction projects. Um, and, and this is the first year we're trying to pull out our concrete maintenance activities from the general contract. Um, I do think that that's going to be more desirable for the contractors and it might take a year or two for more of them to figure that out. Um, I also think that, uh, and again, it's, it's, uh, it's intuitive, but I think that our local contractors might be interested in our maintenance projects because they can use that a little more as filler work and, and keep that work local. So we're going to evaluate that and see how that works and see how successful we are. If it works good, we'll continue doing it. If it doesn't, we'll look at lumping everything back in like we used to. As far as like uh, barriers, when I use the word barriers, that I, I should use more regulations or whatever. Obviously, we want to have the project done a certain time. We, you know, have got schedules and everything else. Are there creative ways that you have seen at different conferences what other municipalities are doing, or are we there isn't really room for much creativity anymore? For concrete work, I'm not sure. Um, you know, in some of the bigger projects. Not only will they include a clause for liquidated damages for delays, sometimes they'll include incentives for uh, performance, possibly, or, yeah. or schedule. If schedule is important, there'll be an incentive. Whatever's important to the owner, and then you know financially, it's important to the contractor that you can you can either get more performance out of them, get it done sooner, or those sorts of things. But Are there concerns with like a one-year guarantee as far as those type of clauses go or whatever? Pretty no. standard. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We, I mean, we've, we haven't heard anything from the contractors like, hey, Rapids is, or any rumors that Rapids is hard to work with or we wish they'd change this or there hasn't been any anything bad um, that we've heard or come across. Crossed. Yeah, I haven't but, heard anything. But we're always that. auditing, you know, trying to make sure that we're protecting the city's interests while trying to secure good competitive bids. Sure, sure. Great, thank you. Um, my question, I was just looking up your public works construction fund in the budget. What was the line item for all of the concrete? It'll be in the various projects. Yeah, so it, it's not a specific contract line item for our budget purposes, but it's it's individual project. I guess um, the reason I'm asking is that are these um, kind of like we went through with the asphalt? I mean, is this a um, situation that this came, the costs are coming in, or the bid is coming in is what you were expecting, or slightly so higher? So we were, we, our engineers estimate we were anticipating a total contract about 482,000. So it, it, it's a little over um, what we were anticipating. And what we were anticipating was what was thrown into the to the budget through our cost estimates, but um, not abnormal for any given no. year. So, and I think to add what, uh, what Mr. Graf is saying is that is that what we're approving is a maximum. If a project doesn't come in, we're not obligated. Correct. To to have that project and to pay that contractor for that particular project. Right. Right. Yeah. It's a unit. It's a uh, unit. Unit, uh, unit cost contract. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I, I didn't recognize you with your haircut. Anything else? And your sweater. Comments. Committee will vote then. All in favor, respond by aye. 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 Opposed. Ayes have it. Item uh, four. Review proposals for administration of any hazardous material encountered during the East Grand Avenue project. So we've got uh, two proposals. A couple extras. Yeah. Um, 
two proposals here uh, for hazardous material. So there's, there's, there's a few sites along the corridor that the city will be responsible for handling the hazardous material for uh, anything that's encountered for not only the DOT contractor and what they dig up with the storm sewer installation, but also the installation for sanitary sewer and water main. And so the city is going to be installing those, the sanitary sewer and water main, but um, the DOT contractor will be installing the, the storm sewer. But in any case, the city's, the city's responsible for handling that. Um, we've worked with, the, so the two proposals we've got back, uh, Robert E. Lee and Associates and REI Engineering. We had solicited from seven, I think, total. And some were interested initially, and then as they, they worked through their schedules, um, they, they weren't interested in submitting. But um, so the nature of the work uh, makes it difficult for them to provide a definitive cost to, for us. And so we tried, what we were asking for was uh, give us your hourly rates and then give us um, you know, some breakout on what the cost estimates might come to, um, like on a per incident sort of situation. And so Robert E. Lee gave us pretty close to exactly what we were looking for. Um, their lump sum fees that they've, they've identified here and then a per incident cost. Um, so one incident and the lump sum fees comes to almost 10 grand. REI um, didn't quite give us, they gave us a lot of hourly rates and um, we requested some further information, some clarification from them. Um, they gave us some more hourly rates, which um, made it, it's making it difficult for us to give a co good comparison of the two and what our cost might actually be if we encounter things out in the field. Um, certainly the, the level of confidence in, in Robert E. Lee, working with them in the past and um, reading through their their um, proposals here, uh, Robert E. Lee had a really strong approach and gave us a lot of confidence that they knew what they were doing and, and going to meet all the, the demands of um, testing and reporting that were going to be needed for the work. Um, so with that basic information, I wish I could give you a little bit clearer comparison on it, but um, from a staff, staff recommendation, um, um, we'd like to go with Robert E. Lee. Um, we don't have specific funds, I, like a line item identification. It's all out of the project costs that's coming from Public Works Construction Fund for the DOT portion from the sanitary budget for that project and the water main budget for that project. And so I, my recommendation would be is if the committee would would uh, approve up to like 20000 and then that would give us some room to work with as things arise. And then um, as we approach that, if it looks like we might need additional funds approved, that's something that we could bring back to committee then. Okay, are we anticipating old gas station type thing or is that well? Yeah, there's a laundromat and petroleum also oh. from gas stations. So we, we're reviewing this more on a uh, performance basis with projected costs, uh, but again, because of, because the the actual conditions in the field won't be absolutely known until the soil is actually exposed. Um, yeah, that's the best we can do. Can you um, elaborate on this particular project? Um, either I can't remember or I don't know or something. Are we looking at, like for this particular scope, are we looking at just in the public right of way? Or if we find that it's on the border of the public right of way, 
then we're notifying adjacent property owners and then they're responsible for that or how would that work? So there's, that's a good question. It's going to depend on, largely on the work that needs to be done. So if, if we're putting in sanitary sewer on the right of way and we encounter it, then that stuff that we dig out, we'll have to properly dispose of and report. If we're putting a sanitary lateral uh, or doing tying in a storm sewer pipe that extends beyond the right of way, but still within the temporary easements that we have for the project, then that cost would also be incurred for the, the proper removal. Um, three of the sites have um, ECFA funding that's still available. And so that's part of part of the services that we're asking for is the property owners allow it in instances like that where we can the hauling of the hazardous material can be paid for out of the ECFA fund. We just have to get their permission up front. So we would get reimbursed obviously it would, it would be our cost initially whether it's paying our own public works department or whatever to, to haul this stuff away but then we could uh, we could issue or offer um, what our costs were and then potentially get reimbursed from that so what what you're asking for tonight is almost uh, an approval to ask finance for a budget amendment of reallocating twenty thousand dollars is that what it is or no it's it's already um, dollars that we're going to uh, expecting to incur right. from the budget so it's already in the project the projects already budgeted we're just looking for a specific approval of a contract for these professional services all right yeah okay yeah i mean yeah especially if it's budget i don't have a problem with that at all i mean it's got to get cleaned up one way or the other if there is stuff so. right well i'll move for now that we go with the twenty thousand that joe was uh, requested as the limit for you know, if need be, they have to come back. 20,000 not to exceed. Right, not to exceed. I second that. Oh, that motion include the selection of Robert E. Lee. Oh, yeah, yeah, Robert E. Lee. Any other questions or anything by anybody? Hearing none, uh, committee will vote. All in favor, respond by aye. I have opposed, I have it. <coughs> And all the way down to number five, review the referral list already. Uh, so nine and ten we can cross off. That's the yep. two items that we addressed this evening. Um, last month, uh, Alderperson Kellogg referred a neighborhood cleanup program. Uh, we're still working on that. We met with. Uh, Met with all the person Kellogg to um, see some examples of some other projects. So we've got some ideas. Um, we're kind of, you can see the report, we're knee deep in several projects. The priorities we currently have are completing our, um, our resurfacing uh, program to present and, and, uh, and bring that back to committee. And I'm currently working with department heads on our capital improvement plan. So those are the those are the top priorities. But this is still a priority. We're, we're working on it. We'll have something before the committee as soon as we possibly can. Don't we had any other referrals at this time? Nope. Uh, well, I, mm, I would like to make a referral to review the uh, the icing and snow removal policy. Okay. Um, it was revised in 84, 89, 95, 96, 97, 08, wow. 10, 12, 14. Yep. I just think uh, anytime you have a major event, it's something that we need to take a look at. One thing in particular um, that was brought to my attention was uh, who's cleaning out the fire hydrants? Who's supposed to clean it out? Is it the utility cleans that out? Is it public works department cleans that out? The fire department, who's responsible for that? Um, that I think we need to address in the policy. And the other thing is, is um, it's not very clearly stated about uh, notifying, not necessarily of the weather service or storm notifications, but I'm talking about who makes that decision, department heads. And I guess I would like the policy to read that 
emergency services would have the ability to contact the street superintendent on call to help them determine hazardous intersections uh, development out on the street that's happening and I know we currently do that I just don't know if it's necessarily defined completely in the policy and I just think maybe if we take a look sure at that, make sure I think it is and but uh, too. yeah in the ordinance it and covers it also mm -hmm. because I did not see I, I had asked for some information about the uh, all I all I received is a policy of de-icing and snow removal so uh, there's an ordinance for that there's an ordinance for snow emergency also in the ordinance mm -hmm. book. Okay, are, are we talking, so maybe we're talking two different things, okay? Are we talking snow emergency or are we talking snow removal? Both. Well, I guess my point is, is that, you know, who makes that decision? Is it clearly defined in the policy? Well, um, I think so. I mean, that's how we've been operating is under the policy and the police department keeps an eye on the conditions and if there are slippery conditions they'll contact the public works superintendent who will then dispatch staff to take care of those areas um, before any major event there's also collaboration between the police department and the street department so that there's an understanding of what the plan is um, and that's helpful for everybody as far as potentially taking cars and, and things like that so that but yeah absolutely it's it's uh, uh, Paul and I were just talking about it today because there's a few items that aren't in the policy that we would like to discuss and, and get in front of the committee so I think it's a great idea I'm assuming looking back at the dates it was probably somewhat uh, happened after an emergency they decided to review the policy um, which is no different than the reason I'm thinking we should look at it mm -hmm. as far as that goes it uh, how does a snow emergency actually happen or what is the definition of a s actual snow emergency how is it advertised to the public and or businesses and then where do you go from there then Sure, so that's spelled out uh, in the ordinance, um, and I'm paraphrasing without actually reading it's it, fine. I don't have it yeah. in front of me, but um, the mayor or the mayor's delegate can declare a snow emergency, and as well as the police department, and so what typically happens is that between uh, the public works superintendent, Paul Bollard, and the police department, they will work together to declare that snow emergency it's automatically for 48 hours but can be shortened and so what they typically do is they determine at the, at the point when they declare it if it'll be shortened and they'll set both when it goes into effect and when it's done um, because we don't want to exclude people from parking on the streets any longer than what we have to and so you know we generally have a pretty good idea depending on the event how long it's going to take us to clean up and uh, you know and so we try to coordinate that right off the bat it is uh, submitted to the paper it's published on the uh, city's Facebook page it's also published on the police department's Facebook page uh, so if people um, have a computer and follow both the city and the police department they'll get those notices um, and I, I can't you know we send the stuff to the paper as we're required to but I can't promise that every time they actually get it published so is it this just popped into my head and the only reason why I know we have a, a an actual cell phone app is because Jennifer notified me or showed me and I downloaded it are we able to get like a push notification through that and I, I'm sure that it's a, you know very infrequently a couple times a year if that but I'm not sure be, I think it also does go out through Nixle, yeah, um, I, Nixle. Say, I think I get mine on Nixle but but I don't know that our app I'll have to research that and that we do do it for Nixle I was unaware of that too I, I, I know that what Nixle is and I, I know that Nixle is available but I didn't know that we did that so that would be something to that you know, <laughs> right so that's again uh, cooperation through our police department and, and Wood County uh, Wood County Sheriff's Department um, I believe has the the subscription in Nixle and then they work with our police department and forward that 
out. So, and that is a subscription-based service. So, you can uh, you can subscribe to certain areas or countywide, but that's another way to get it out. Um, we've been a little hit or miss as far as getting it on the website. Typically, what happens is, you know, we declare the emergency. It's a weird time of the day. The guys are focused on uh, doing the removals and and. You know, are counting on the police department to take care of those other notifications, and so oftentimes we'll we'll not get the website updated to to identify the snow emergency at least on the street department page. Um, so we have been a bit hit or miss on that, and we're you know trying to figure out how you know how can we how can we still get everything done. You know, that communication part is important. Though. Is this the same policy unless I'm renamed correctly, or is it no, an actual it. ordinance? Yep, but there's also an ordinance. Okay. For snow emergencies, if you could email me that information when you get an opportunity, or if you come across it, because I'd like to review it. Yeah. Scott, how I find it? With regard to the first referral with Eighth Street, I participated in a workshop at Stevens Point University uh, two weekends ago. Uh, it was on a Saturday, and they have an urban study, and they used Eighth Street as a capstone study. So what they did is the um, students that were seniors, uh, they came to Wisconsin Rapids in I think four groups or five groups, but they entered the, the city from different uh, locations, coming in from Plover, coming in from Marshfield, coming in from Rome, et cetera, just to get a sense of their first impression of Wisconsin Rapids. And then they, um, they had a long, they, at the meeting, we first got there and they had um, each group share, was sharing what they, their first impression from the direction that they came in. So you could go to group to group and you moved around. And they were right on with comments that they made. And then uh, we sat at tables and there, I was there, Adam was there, other people, um, uh, Madeline, um, some people from the health department, sat at different tables and they had, they, I would guess the number of students might have been like 30 or 40 students and they broke up in like six tables and then each table had a section, that group or the, the seniors focused on a section of A Street and so I sat at a section of A Street that was from Plover, um, just the north end of A Street, uh, past house school and so forth. And then they were to look at that section and come up with ideas that um, the city might do with regard to it. Then there's another section, that table talked about that, another section. And then they, they had table discussions and they made suggestions right at the table from, so then you had freshmen there, sophomore there, and juniors that, gave ideas to the seniors and they were writing it on. Then at the conclusion of the um, morning or afternoon then, um, they put these maps up on the wall and then each senior had to explain what they talked about at their table. It was kind of interesting. You get a wide variety of ideas. I mean, these students have been studying urban planning and so forth. And so they come up with maybe ideas that were Ambit ambitious <laughs> that you really couldn't do, but yet it's the idea of what it could be and you can always scale it back. And it was kind of exciting. So I suspect, and there were two professors, and I suspect that they'll be giving us the result of this capstone project to Wisconsin Rapids. And from there, we could glean what's practical, work with maybe the stores and businesses along A Street to see if we could um, marry some of the ideas together with, with what they might do and businesses working together, landscaping working with a business. But it might be a catalyst to this problem of Bay Street, of just the appearance and, and other things. And uh, I just wanted to share that with you and, I, and we'll have to just wait for their final report. But it was kind of fun and um, it's, it's a progress toward improving that area, so. Just so you know. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Oh, there you That's very interesting. Keep this up to speed or yeah, yeah. something. It was fun.
I felt so old. <laughs> All these kids are 21, 22, 23. But yet they had great ideas. So you sit there and say, wow, if you had a blank slate, you know, uh, and just say you, how you could design it, you get, whoa. But uh, maybe we can glean a few good things from there and make a difference. Cool. Uh, if nothing else, uh, referrals were to item six to adjourn. I'll so move to adjourn. So moved. Oops. Or I mean, no, I'm that's all right. <laughs> What's it second? I, I was I was just going to mention that we still got 14 minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, no, we I, 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 I second that. Oh, we'll sure. Off next Here. month's agenda or something. <laughs> All right, we have more to thank that you're in all in favor respond by aye. Aye. Both sides have it. Thank you. We're adjourned. Yeah. That's have interesting, Scott. I'll be curious to see that. Yeah.